I know that hymn's an oldie but goodie, but it never gets old to me. I love that hymn. So thank you, gang, for leading us in that this morning. This text doesn't come up all that often at Christmas time, but it's a Christmas text. And because of the unusual calendar in this year, I get to preach it. About every six years, I get to preach this text. And we, we need to be reminded of it quite often because despite the impression that the world gets that when people give their life to Christ, everything is wonderful and there are never any struggles or torments evermore. I got a text from a good friend and former colleague and his wife. I did their wedding to inform us that she has just been diagnosed with a very serious cancer. And I think of her as being so young. <laughs> she's, she's now a grandmother with grandchildren in middle school, so uh, she's not all that young, but in my mind, she's still young. And uh, as I, I, I didn't even speak it to Marlo, I, I just showed her the text. And she just looked at me and she said, how much more? How much more can they take? Their foster son, who they adopted about two and a half, three years ago, it was a lineman for an electrical company in New York State and had a 90-foot fall. wife and two kids, he now has to live in a group home. It's a wonder he's still alive. And believe it or not, he's driving again, but not able to live with his family, so they come as a family to be with him once a month. And Marlo says, how much more, Lord? We have other friends, two different couples, one older, <laughs> all of our friends are older, one even older than us. They lost their five-year-old son to leukemia a very virile leukemia that set in and ended his life very quickly. A year later, their 12-year-old son was killed in a sledding accident. Several years later, a family friend of ours had a son who was killed in a mysterious virus. He was about two or three years old. And then their kindergarten age son at the, the spring party picnic, there were strong winds and a branch broke and came down and landed on top of him. And within a year, year and a half, they had lost two sons. So Marlo and I got both couples together for dinner. One an older couple, the other a younger couple still raising three other kids. And we went through the perfunctory social graces as we began the meal. 
And then I just said something. I don't even remember what I said. To kind of open the conversation that, you know, we minister types. I was with Young Life back then, but I was a minister type. You know, I'm, I'm the guy who usually leads discussions. We might as well have left, left the room because we sat back and watched these two couples begin to minister to each other. Henry Nowen wrote a seminal study book called The Wounded Healer. And aren't we all Aren't we all wounded? Look at our prayer list. Look at our funeral schedule over the past two months. We're wounded. And that is part of the way of the cross. So let us not be misrepresented to the world. On the one hand, and we sell it most, celebrate it most deeply around this table that reminds us of the death that Christ Led, was led to for us, and yet we come with joy, do we not? And unless you haven't figured it out, I really do enjoy being a citizen of the kingdom of God. There really is joy, 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 joy down in my heart. But like all of us, I also hurt deeply. And even in just a year, quite often with you, as you do with each other. So we need to look at this text. And we need to remember that there's a reason that this is included by Matthew in his gospel. He wants to make sure that we get the whole picture. Matthew 2, 13 to 23. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord, and they are the wise men, the magi, or I love how Eugene Peterson in the message describes them, the scholars, uh, because that's really what they were. They were what? after the Middle Ages, would have been referred to as Renaissance men. Uh, they were uh, the upper class who were free to study this and study that and developed a kind of grace and all of that and were regarded as distinctively wise and special in their culture. And that included the study of astronomy. They had followed the star. And they had an angel appear to them, uh, appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get up, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Why did the Magi leave? Anyone remember? What, had, what was their experience even before this? It says when they had gone, why did they leave? They were warned in a dream. This is a dreamy passage. They were warned in a dream. Now Joseph and Mary are warned in a dream. They're going to get another dream. Some of you are thinking, hmm, I guess I've been sleeping too deeply or not deeply enough. 
Dreams were very important to the Jews because they believed that God often communicated through dreams and visions. And that's certainly the case here, and Matthew makes it very clear. So they got up and they took the child and his mother, uh, Joseph did, during the night and left for Egypt where he stayed until the death of Herod, and this is Herod the Great. There are Herods all over the place. If any of you have a study Bible, often you will find a chart in your study Bible of all the different Herods and which one is which. And just when you get it figured out, you read on and Christmas occurs again, you gotta go back and go over the chart again. But Herod the Great was the really crazy Herod. And Archelaus, his son, who ruled in the southern district, was almost as crazy as his father. You read in the silent preparation a bit uh, of how uh, manic uh, the Herods could get. Uh, and so it was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. And I'm sure there were some families, like my mother and father's family, where if that law had gone out in our land, they would have lost two sons, my brother and I. He would have been the two-year-old and I would have been the under. There was a lot of weeping in the hill country of Judea. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in that stage of grief where you just can't be comforted. And men, I hate to say this to all of us, but the women are better at this than we are. We tend to be fixers. So when people are weeping around us, we want to fix things. But there is a weeping for which there is no immediate comfort. How many of you have experienced that? Yeah. We know, don't we? Because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph, here we go again, in Egypt this time, and said, get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, he took the child and his mother, and he went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there because he knew that Herod Archelaus was just as crazy as his father. And here we go again. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. And of course, that was no strange place to himself and to Mary. That's where they were uh, in the beginning before they went to the town of his birth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. And his one disciple actually said, has anything good ever come out of Nazareth? It would take people 
with really open minds and searching hearts to get through to the truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray silently for the proclamation of God's word for all of us this morning. Lord, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It's almost like an obstacle course. (laughs) It's like the devil is throwing bombs. And some of us at certain times of our lives are better at dodging those bombs than others. And most of us, not all, and it's only by the grace of God that we never get hit, but most of us do get hit, at least by a little shrapnel. Because if we haven't figured it out yet, the devil is angry. And if we're a little disturbed by the language, the devil, forget Flip Wilson. We're not talking about a comical devil. We're talking about the devil that is described in the revelation that comes from Jesus himself to John at Patmos. And John describes at the time of the birth that as the woman is in pain, getting ready to give birth, hovering over everything is the dragon, which is the devil, who is determined to come and grab the woman and devour her and the child that is to be the savior and the king of kings. And Michael and the archangels They come and they battle it out. While Mary is giving birth, they're battling it out. And hear the good news, folks, because this is the whole purpose of the book of Revelation. We win. But what we need to be aware of is that the devil is angry. And he gets angrier still when Jesus dies on the cross. And pays the price for sin so that we can be free. It's kind of like that old stage show and movie, Mr. Roberts. Do you remember how that ended? How many of you remember that old film and, and, and show? After... Mr. Roberts finally gets released from being in charge of that boat that they're on, that nothing boat while everybody else is out uh, fighting the war and he keeps putting in letters to get where the action is and uh, James Cagney, who is the mean captain, keeps intercepting the letters because he wants Mr. Roberts to do all his work for him. Finally, Mr. Roberts gets through and he He gets released from his duty on that boat, and he goes out where the real war is being fought. And then a telegram comes to the guys on the boat informing them that he has been killed in action. And the fresh ensign played by Jack Lemmon who's been nothing but a goof the entire film, suddenly storms up to the brig where the captain is, tears his palm tree off the chains that that it's tied to and throws it overboard. And James Cagney, the captain of the ship, looks out and lowers his shoulders and says, oh no, another Mr. Roberts. (laughs) 
Well, folks, for two millennia, we, by the grace of God, have had the opportunity to make the devil scream, oh no, another Jesus person, another victorious one. Because that's the battle that begins right here. Is this enough to snuff them out? Is this enough to warn them off? Is this enough to discourage them from living life the way they have been called to live life for Yahweh, who has now sent his only son to rescue them from sin and free them to be full citizens of the kingdom of heaven? Oh, no! I'm going to get them. I'm going to get them. And then we're left with a choice. The wise men are thrust right into the battle. And it's revealed to them through the angel, hey, you can't trust Herod. Don't go back and give him any information. He's been very nice to you. He says he's going to come and worship this child. Don't believe it. He's out to kill him. Go back another way. They choose to be loyal to the new king. Mary and Joseph are informed through a dream. Take the baby. Go to Egypt. But Mr. Angel, we've never been to Egypt. Our budget doesn't include that. How are we going to do that? It says they got up right away and they took off. They choose to protect Jesus. And here's the toughest one. How would you like to be one of Herod's soldiers? You are to go out tomorrow to the Judean hill country and in the whole region surrounding Bethlehem, kill every boy up to three years old. Kill them. Don't imprison them. Kill them. Can you imagine? What would you do if you received those orders? Some of you have been to war. And you know how difficult it is when the enemy uses children as shields or innocent civilians. This sinful world is a messy business. So Matthew, of all things, goes to Isaiah 49, which, by the way, is another homecoming passage. And we are all experts on homecoming passages, aren't we? We know what Isaiah does. He has these awful consequences of sin, which he describes, God's judgment, and then he talks about God's grace coming and bringing the captives his people back and restoring them after having paid the penalty for their sin. 
Isaiah 49 is the one where we have that famous picture of God speaking and saying, do you think your nursing mothers care about their children? Well, I care for you even more. I will never forget you. I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. And then come the words of judgment and the weeping of Rachel, Jacob's favorite wife. For the children of Israel who have been carried off to Babylon. And she can't be comforted. But as you will see in your sermon notes, in this very special little excerpt from Wendy Murray Zoba, and uh, I, I love to reread this on occasion. Uh, it was actually uh, in a little article in a Christianity Today magazine years ago. And here's what Wendy Zoba says about this verse. In the verse that follows Rachel's lament, Jeremiah writes, Don't weep any longer, for I will reward you. Your children will come back to you. God's portrait of grief, the weeping mother, is painted over with his picture of joy and resolution. Children returning. The prophet Isaiah describes it. See, I will give a signal to the godless nations. They will carry your sons back to you in their arms. They will bring your daughters on their shoulders. So Rachel will be comforted after all. Our friends are getting older. I used to think of the husband who lost the two sons as kind of my substitute big brother after my big brother died. He's 11 years older than me. And uh, some of you are younger thinking, boy, he must be old. And others of you are thinking, well, John's not that old. <laughs> They're both getting older now. And at one point in Bible study together, we were talking about death. And Gail, the wife, said, <laughs> she said, uh, I'm not morbid or anything. I'm enjoying my life and I'm enjoying my girls. She said, but I'm not fearing death. There's a big part of me that's looking forward to it. Because then I'm going to get a chance to be with Stephen and Andrew. My time with them was oh so short. So this is very sad. I even have tears in my eyes. I'm saddened. I'm still saddened for all those little boys. I have three sons. But there is a joy, 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 joy deep in my heart. And Linda, who has been through her share of sadness the past year and a half, at one point went like this. We win. Don't ever forget it. We win. And we don't have to go around looking down upon people as we rest in that assurance but we don't have to go around hanging our heads either, folks. We comfort each other. We love each other, but we never forget that we win. 
Rachel will be comforted after all. And this is where we are constantly reminded of that assurance. Let us pray. We thank you, O Lord, that you keep reminding us that you don't leave us separated and distraught and alone from you, but that you rescue us and you give us assurance that you will come and restore us to your loving arms. We thank you for this. In the name of Jesus, our rescuer. Amen.